I work with Red Hat OpenShift Storage. So a storage guy is going to tell you something about uh, SC Linux, because SC Linux has surprising con uh, consequences in the storage world, in OpenShift especially. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce what is SC Linux, why do we have it. However, I will dive deeper into containers, into Kubernetes, and how OpenShift uses uh, SC Linux, and what surprises are waiting for you there. So first, we start with uh, POSIX, or Linux, without SE Linux. Uh, the security in the operating system is done using user IDs and GIDs in processes, owners on files, and permissions of files. So if I'm run, running a web server as Apache user, it needs to open static web page. A kernel will check the owner process, owner of the file, the permission bits, access is allowed. When somebody hacks the web server over the network and tries to do bad things, for example, read or write etc shadow, uh, Linux will check owner of the process, owner of the file, access is denied. We use this a million times per day, these permissions. Problem is that security issues happen. Vulnerabilities happen. Sometimes, if, you, if the attacker is lucky, they can get root, root privileges in the web server. And now, uh, Linux will check the permissions bit, uh, permi owner of the process, owner of the file, it will allow the attacker to access a file they should not access. Simple. So, and that's why people invented SE Linux. SE Linux. Aye. And something is terribly wrong. I should see a picture, which I don't see. Sorry about that. So, project. Talks. <laughs> I need to update the web server. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, people invented a Linux. A Linux adds additional layer of protection. It's independent on these uh, users, on these permission bits. Every single process gets a label, it's a Linux label. HTTPD in this, uh, HP, HTTP D, D in this case. Every file gets a label. And uh, there is a policy in kernel, a Linux policy in the kernel, that allows HTTPD process, that's this, uh, to open files with HTTPD content thief label. This is this thing. So HTTPD process can still open its static web, web page. But even if the web server is running as root, there is no rule that would allow HTTPDT to access shadow T file. So this gets denied despite the web server runs as root. So SE Linux uh, can deny root to do bad things. So that's why we have SE Linux on the regular Linux without any containers, without anything. So how it is applied in the containers? Most people use containers as a cheap virtual machines. Uh, containers are supposed to be isolated from the operating system and uh, from each other. Problem with containers is that they sometimes don't contain. Sometimes it is possible to escape the container and do bad things on the host, do bad things in other containers. So smart people introduced as Linux in containers. Uh, if you run a container by default, without any spe special policies, without any special labels, the container will run as, uh, with a label container T, and all files of a container will have container file T. And the policy is very simple. Container T can do anything to container file T. Uh, and to distinguish between different containers, we use multi-category security policy in SC Linux. So each container gets a random two categories. This one got C53 and C79. And also the files got the same category in their label. And when a process with these categories wants to access a file with categories, 
these categories must match. So each container gets its own combination of two, two categories. Why two? Because one is not enough and three is, are too much. Uh, this category is, uh, <laughs> uh, the category is an integer between 0 and 1,023. So if we use one category, we would be able to run 1,024 containers on a machine. It's not much. So uh, if we are using two categories, we can run, I don't know, half a million, half a million containers on a single machine, and that's enough. We don't need three categories. So if somebody uh, manages to escape the container and tries to access files of different container, uh, these categories will not match, and SCLinux will deny that access. And if the somebody tries to escape the container and try to access something on the host, uh, then the default policy will catch that because container T cannot access shadow T. Uh, using this uh, multi-category security policy, the idea behind that is that what happens in a container stays in the container. People can still hack HTTPD, they can do all the mess inside the container. They can mine bitcoins, they can join botnet, they can do all the bad things, but inside the container. The host is safe, other containers are safe. The container itself, it's not safe. Uh, if you use Podman or Cryo, SCLinux is enabled by default. If you use Docker or Containerd, uh, you need to enable them explicitly. However, uh, all of them behave the same. They will allocate these random categories and so on. So I could end here. The like containers are now safe. You cannot escape a container. However, we have problems with, with, uh, with the container that there they are ephemeral. If you run MongoDB in a container, it will create empty database. You can save some data to the database. But when the container stops, all this data are, is deleted. They are ephemeral. So people want to run Mongo, and they want to save the data persistently. Uh, for that, uh, there is a concept of container volumes. Uh, in my example here, here I use SDB as a persistent storage for Mongo database. I will mount it to mount my Mongo directory, it doesn't really matter. But when I run a container, I can tell the container runtime to map my Mongo from the host to slash data slash DB inside the container. So when Mongo starts, it will create the database in this directory, but in this directory is, in fact, uh, my Mongo on the host, and that is actually mounted as DB. So all the databases that Mongo creates, they will end up in, on the disk. And when Mongo stops, the data stays there. They are not deleted. So this concept is called container volumes. And there is a glitch here. Uh, I told you containers cannot access anything on the host, but my Mongo is a directory on the host. So if you try to run it, you get permission denied. Because SCLinux is preventing you from accessing the directory on the host. For that, we have options in this uh, dash V parameter. You can provide some option after double colon. After double colon. If you don't provide any option, uh, the container runtime will just bind mount the stuff from the host inside the container. It's up to you to either relabel the things uh, by yourself, or give the SCLinux container the right SCLinux policy. Or you can ask uh, the container runtime to, re to relabel the stuff for you. So if you use capital Z, the container runtime will assign, uh, will go through the whole volume, the whole directory in the source, and assign container private label with both categories of the container. And only that container can access that data. You can use lowercase z. It will apply a shared label without these categories. And any container can access the data. So you can share a single volume between many containers. So I fix my example. I provide uh, capital Z. I don't want to share this data among containers. Uh, and 
container runtime will relabel my Mongo directory. It will apply some label, and Mongo is finally running. So let's dive deeper what actually happens when you type this command. I don't provide any SCLinux label. So by default, Podman will assign uh, random categories. I am lucky I got C1, C2. Uh, Podman will download the container image. It will download a Mongo from the internet. And it will unpack it somewhere in varlib containers. And it will rel relabel this uh, container image with contain container file T, C1, C2 categories, so the container process can read it. This is usually very quick, because varlib containers is on SSD or something. You don't need to worry about that. What you need to worry is uh, my Mongo directory, because uh, container runtime will go through every single file in this directory and relabel them to file T, C1, C2. So the container, so the Mongo can access this file. And if this directory is huge, it has millions of files, it has deep directory hier hierarchy, it can take time for the container runtime to relabel it. So your, con your containers will can start very, very slowly. And in the end, after everything is relabeled, and all the month spaces happen, and process namespaces, and whatever, uh, Mongo starts with the assigned SNUX label. It can access my Mongo directory. It can access the container image. And everybody is happy. Uh, and this happens every single time the container starts. If you restart the container, it will get a different label, random label. It, the image will get relabeled. My Mongo directory will be relabeled every single time the container starts. So of course, uh, this can be a problem. Uh, this relabeling can be really, really slow, especially if you use some sto slow storage backend on, on the network. There are some hiccups on the network. It can be slow. Another problem is that uh, Docker always relabels. So if you have access to Docker container, uh, Docker will be so kind that not only it will bind mount the host etc shadow into your container, it will also relabel it so you can access it. Uh, by the way, this uh, example is kind of fake because etc shadow has a special protection. It cannot be relabeled, but you can imagine any, like, any secret data, private keys, SSH keys, this kind of stuff uh, that you usually cannot access. But if you have access to Docker, Docker socket, uh, Docker will give it to you, and Docker will relabel it for you. So you can access all the bad data, all the data that you should not access. Uh, for example, you can try the whole host, the whole, the whole root of the volume to get into container. Docker will be so happy, and it will relabel the whole host for you. So uh, don't give access to Docker socket to anybody. Uh, and if you do, use rootless Docker and rootless Podman. So they are not able to relabel things. And of course, uh, you should not relabel anything on the host. Because if you relabel anything on the host, uh, the Another thing may lose access to that thing, to the, to the directory. In what you should do instead, you should write a Linux policy. Uh, you should write a policy that Mongo container can access slash mnt my Mongo on the host. And that's the right way how to run containers using Podman, using Docker. Uh, there is Ujitsa tool that can generate the policy for you. Uh, if you are using Podman, uh, if you are using Kubernetes on OpenShift, there are no automated tools. But there are tools that can inject policy into a Linux, and uh, they can help you to provide the policy. So this was uh, this was Podman and Docker. You have few options. You can either relabel or you can provide your own policy and run containers as your uh, with a specific label. How it works in Kubernetes? Uh, Kubernetes provides uh, Kubernetes uh, is a container orchestration engine. It runs many containers at scale. If you want to run a container, uh, 
At some point, you need to define the container in YAML file or in uh, API object. And there is a special field where you can set label of your con container. And if you want, you can also provide the MCS categories. All that Kubernetes does, Kubernetes takes that and gives it to container runtime. And that's it. Uh, people usually don't put uh, their Linux labels into their pods, into their containers. That means the default what is in the container runtime will happen. That means all the pods get random MCS categories by default. I haven't seen a pod that actually explicitly sets a Linux label in Kubernetes. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, yeah, uh, another thing. Then, uh, if you use Podman or uh, Docker, you can choose what kind of label you want to apply on your volumes. Not in Kubernetes. There is no choice. All volumes will have private label. Uh, there is no API to set shared label. There is no API to opt out from relabeling. So every time you style a container, you get probably random MCS categories. All the volumes of the container would get relabeled to that uh, random MCS categories. And get, it can get pretty hard to share, share volumes between two containers, uh, between two pods. If I have two pods that you want to share the volume at the same time, I must, I might, I must, I must make, make sure that these two pods have the same Linux label. Uh, I can set the label manually in the pod. This will become tedious. This will become hard to track. Uh, you could try policy engines like Gatekeeper, Kiverno, many of them. Uh, I haven't tried. They could, be, they could inject the Linux label to pods, but I haven't tried. Usually, they don't know anything about the Linux because nobody cares about the Linux in the Kubernetes community. So uh, there's a catch of Kubernetes. Uh, most of the containers will have random MCS labels. And all the volumes will have private labels. We'll have uh, private labels. Sharing becomes hard. And of course, uh, every single container starts, it will relabel all the volumes of all, uh, of, all, all volume of the container. So every single time container starts, there is some overhead with relabeling. Uh, in OpenShift, uh, we support only Cryo as the container engine, as Linux is in enforcing. I think we are the only enterprise Kubernetes distribution that runs Kubernetes enforcing. Uh, and on the positive side, uh, we have sort of a policy engine uh, called security context constraints. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to go over SCCs. Uh, from a Linux perspective, when you create a namespace in Kubernetes in, open, in OpenShift, uh, it gets some random uh, MCS categories. It's a namespace. And when you use a restricted security constant context constraint, which is the default one, this is the one uh, which has the most security guardrail, guardrails. Uh, it will force you to run secure pods. When you use this restricted SCC, uh, this uh, annotation from the namespace gets injected into S Linux labels in a pod. So all pods running in the namespace will have the same S Linux label. And that's good, because uh, suddenly all the pods can share data in their volumes. All the pods will have the same 55, 20 categories. All the, all the volumes will have the same category, and they can share data easily inside the volume. However, the security is kind of uh, re relaxed. Uh, it's not long longer what happens in a container stays in the container. Now it's what happens in namespace stays in the namespace. So if somebody escapes a container, they can damage other pods in the same namespace, but they cannot access anything outside of the namespace. And sharing data among namespaces is still hard. You can do dirty tricks. Uh, 
I would encourage you not to access data across namespaces. A namespace is very hard boundary. Don't try to jump it. And there are many uh, security context constraints. Uh, one of them is privileged. Uh, you need to have elevated uh, permissions in OpenShift to use privileged SCC, and that effectively removes all the guardrails from from the pod offer, offer. And now it's up to the pod offer to either provide a Linux label in pods or let Scryo to generate the random, random one. So if you mix uh, restricted and privileged pods in the same namespace, they may not be able to access data of each other because the restricted ones get, get stable, as Linux labels, and the privileged one, they can get random ones if you are not careful. So if you run privileged pods, uh, be very careful about the labeling, otherwise you are not you will not be able to access data. So that was OpenShift. Very stupid comparison. Uh, in vanilla Kubernetes without any policy engines, it's hard to share data even inside the namespace. In OpenShift, it becomes easy within a namespace. And if I try to compare, if you run pods, uh, if you run containers manually using Podman or Docker, uh, you have few options. You can either opt out from relabeling of the volumes, the, and then you can provide your own policy, or you can apply shared label, you can apply private label. If you use Kubernetes and OpenShift, you have no such option. Always, the private label is always applied on all volumes except for host path. If you use just host path to access files on the host, the security profiles operator can he help you. If you use persistent volumes, then uh, there are some workarounds how to not relabel, but they are not that obvious. So I have been mentioning relabeling a couple of times. And that's actually when SLinux bites, and it can bite you hard. Imagine uh, Alice is a DevOps engineer in a small company. Uh, she wants to run Jenkins with persistent storage for the test artifacts, like test logs, text, test results, some dumps, and so on. So she runs uh, her Jenkins deployment uh, with empty persistent volume. Container, what the container runtime does, it relabels the volume, the volume is empty, it's relabeled instantly. No issues at all. Now, uh, she runs Jenkins. Uh, let's say each Jenkins job leaves about 20 files uh, on the persistent volume. Uh, they will inherit their SNOOX labels from the parent directory in constant time, saving 20 files, no issue at all, everything is super fast. Jenkins runs about 20 jobs per hour. It's very, it's very quiet, Jenkins. This is, this is small deployment. Uh, so basically, Jenkins saves 400 files per hour. No big deal. Everything is super fast. Problem is when Alice decides to update Jenkins after half a year. After half a year, there are 1.7 million of files on that volume. And when she starts new, container with new version of Jenkins, the container runtime will relabel. There is no opt-out by default. So the cryo goes through 1.7 million of files. Uh, these Jenkins artifacts, they are, they are not that important. That means like they are very likely on some very cheap, very slow volume. So uh, cryo relabels 1.7 million of files. Jenkins is not running. Uh, Alice sees uh, my Jenkins is not running. Maybe the upgrade broke it. So she tries to downgrade. She, resta she stops the new Jenkins po container, starts old Jenkins container, and what happens? Relabeling starts from the scratch. <laughs> so Jenkins is still not running. Alice gets desperate. She starts restarting nodes, pods, everything. Every time she restarts the container, the labeling starts from scratch. 
And nobody has any idea why that happens. Nobody knows about S Linux. When you run Jenkins, when you run Jenkins, you don't, you don't see any S Linux problems. Only when you start a new port, things start failing, and nobody suspects S Linux. But Alice gets up, Alice gets really desperate. Uh, it gets management attention. They call support. They escalate, and they try to figure out what's going on. And after long call with support, because support tries the easy f things first, after long call with support, they will figure out, okay, it's S Linux. Who is to blame? And people start hating OpenShift because if you run vanilla Kubernetes, you don't have that problem, right? So that's when S Linux bites. It bites really, really hard in a very not obvious way. <laughs> So uh, what can we suggest as uh, Alice? She can disable S Linux for that single pod. She can run a Jenkins pod with SPC, super privileged container, like S Linux label, that effectively disables S Linux for that single pod. So what happens? There is no relabeling. No relabeling will happen. Jenkins will start quickly. However, if somebody hacks Jenkins, Jenkins can escape the container. It can do damage on the host. It can do damage to other containers. If it is worth the, if it is worth, I let Alice to decide. It's her, it's her uh, cluster. Another op option we have in Cryo, and only in Cryo, is that after quite elaborate setup that I will not go through, uh, Alice can label her pod with a magic annotation. And when Cryo starts a pod with this annotation, uh, Cryo will check the top directory of the volume. If it looks like it has the right label, then it will skip relabeling. And if it has unexpected label, then the Cryo will label the whole volume. That means uh, the volume needs to be labeled once, but then all the subsequent start, uh, container startups are very quick. And the last thing you Alice can try, and that's why I'm here as a, as a storage engineer, uh, there is a way how to mount a volume using a context, or context mount option. And I can provide a Linux label. And if I use this mount option, then all the files on the mounted option will look like they have this label. Uh, this is not stored in the storage backend. This is not stored on the disk. Stored on the disk. Uh, this is just some metadata in Linux kernel. Every time a Linux kernel checks what's the label of files on the disk, uh, they will get just the metadata from the. They will just get label from the metadata. Uh, it took several years to implement because uh, there were kernel cases we needed to we needed to iron out. So Alice needs, needs a very new Kubernetes uh, 129. The feature is limited to read, write, one spot volumes. Uh, if you don't know Kubernetes, you don't know what this access mode means. It means that this volume can be used by a single pod only at the time. So in Kubernetes 129, we have implementation for some uh, volumes. This is available in OpenShift for 16. And uh, I am right. I wrote an implementation for all the other volume types. This is alpha in Kubernetes 130. It will be an open sheet for 17 as dev preview. Not only she needs a uh, new Kubernetes, she needs compatible CSI driver for most of the CSI drivers. Uh, it doesn't require any code change. Uh, this uh, CSI driver, CSI storage drivers, basically. Uh, they need change in the YAML files, basically. Uh, if there is a storage driver that uses NFS or SMB, they may need to apply additional mount options to make this context working. And the third thing that uh, Alice needs to ensure is that Kubernetes knows the SLinux label that uh, it should apply during mount. If there is no uh, SLinux label in a pod, then uh, 
the, it's the control container runtime that will uh, assign one randomly, but it's too late because uh, at that point, uh, volumes are already mounted. So either if you use vinyl Kubernetes, you need to set labels manually in your pods. If you use OpenShift, you get them, uh, you get them injected manu automatically. And the problem with this is that it may break some use cases. We know at least one use case uh, we are going to break when two pods with two different Asterisk contexts share the same volumes but different subdirectories of it. Uh, if uh, it's the container runtime who relabels, it is possible to use that single volume with two different uh, directories labeled differently. But when we are using mount, the whole volume will have a single Asterisk context and it's not possible to have two different directories with two different contexts. So we are going to break this use case. I don't, I hope that nobody runs uh, this crazy setup with one volume, different subdirectories, different contexts. If you do, please tell me. And we don't know what else could break. Uh, we spent quite long time designing this. We spent quite long time uh, cutting, uh, fixing the corner cases. But if you run OpenShift, or especially if you run Kubernetes with SC Linux, I would like to meet such person. Uh, because in OpenShift, we, we do our stuff. I can test it. But I don't know what people run with vanilla Kubernetes. I don't know. If you run vanilla Kubernetes with, with SC Linux, please talk to me. Uh, we need testers. Uh, and and so if you use OpenShift and you are trying to share, vol share volumes in between namespaces, for example, or in some unconven unconventional way, please test these two features. Even if it succeeds, please provide your feedback. It, it works. Uh, it would be very helpful for me. So quick summary. S3 Linux is there to, yes. Uh, yes, then has a comment that if uh, if I don't provide the MCS categories, I just use S0, it will be shareable. However, uh, there is no API in Kubernetes to tell which volume would be shareable and which volume would could be sh uh, should be strict. And as I said, all the all the volumes in Kubernetes apply private labels. So we are mimicking that in the mount. The, the S mounts are in uh, open source what that means. That means mount for you. Sorry? The S mounts are the alpha alpha for seventeen. Yes, it will mount. So in this mount in for seventeen, it will use exactly this mount on all volumes. If all these condition, all these other conditions are satisfied, then it will do this mount with the private categories. Okay, summary. So S Linux is there to protect the host or other containers. It will not protect insides of the containers. So whatever happens in the container stays in the container. You can mine Bitcoin in the container. Uh, S Linux will not help. In OpenShift, whatever happens in namespace stays in the namespace. Uh, in Kubernetes, if you want to run Kubernetes with S3 Linux, you probably need some policy engine or a lot of manual config configuration. If you run OpenShift, you have security context constraints, and they are actually useful in this case. Like in most cases, people don't like them because they are too restrictive. In S3 Linux case, they are useful. They will inject the labels for you. And uh, when a container runs, you will not notice a Linux. It just works. It does its protection. It's super fast. Nobody ever complained. Where a Linux bytes is relabeling. When you have huge, con huge volume, container starts, container runtimes relabels. That's where it bytes, and it has very surprising consequences. Are there any questions? Or did I lose you? <laughs> Yes. Uh, so the time it takes to relabel, does it matter the size of the file or does it just the number of 
So question is, uh, when container runtime relabels, if it matters size of the file or just the number, and it's just the number. Size, size doesn't matter. You can have petabytes of big files, and it will, they will be relabeled instantly. What also matters is what storage backend is behind the volume. If you use some iSCSI fiber channel, something that is on block device, it's usually much faster than when you use uh, something with slow metadata operations like NFS or CFFS. CFFS bytes is not that great with metadata operations. Yes, other <laughs> Can you please repeat the question louder? <laughs> Uh, all this, so question was about the CVEs. Uh, all the CVEs that I saw in container runtime would be fixed by a Linux, at least that I remember. I don't remember all of them. Do you remember any that would, where S Linux wouldn't help? So all of them would be blocked by a Linux. Yes? So question is when you run vanilla Kubernetes and uh, you don't configure anything special, container runtime will allocate random uh, categories. If it is different in Ubuntu, RHEL, other systems, is it the, the question? Oh, well, actually, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I would expect uh, all the container policies to be the same and Ubuntu would do, do the same thing, but I haven't tried. I haven't tried Ubuntu, maybe. I'm sorry, we are out of time. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>